just give a warm welcome. Hello and welcome to the Just In Time Cafe's webinar. I am Elizabeth Swan, co-founder of the Just In Time Cafe. I'll be your moderator today. And today's webinar is titled, How to Create Psychological Safety at Work Using the Five C's. The Five C's of Psychological Safety. Uh, let's see, I've got two fabulous presenters with me today. That is Karen Ross and Jessica House. Uh, hello, gals. Hello. Karen, if you don't know her, is an artist, an internationally acclaimed speaker, award-winning author, consultant, coach, and practitioner. She's the owner of KRC, Karen Ross Consulting. She is one of the founding mothers of the Women in Lean Hour table. Karen is also founder and president of the Love and Kindness Project Foundation, a registered public charity, uh, and the New School for Kind Leaders. She created both of these initiatives to help people around the world think, speak, act, and lead more kindly. Karen travels the globe teaching people her unique system of combining creativity, continuous improvement, and kindness to make a better world. Okay, now I got to catch my breath a second. <laughs> This woman is busy. This woman does a lot in this world. I also am incredibly excited to have Jessica House here today. Jessica is an experienced counselor and coach with a diverse background, which is incredibly helpful to this topic, that includes mental health services, leadership, and lean management. By combining both lean and mental health, Jessica started her own business called Lighthouse Consulting, uh, excuse me, Lighthouse Consulting and Wellness, where she collaborates with individuals, families, and organizations to set and achieve ambitious goals, improve performance, and enhance people's overall wellness. Two amazing, amazing women. Thank you so much for coming to the cafe. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for having us, Elizabeth. And yeah, just, say just as many fabulous, fun things about you. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm going to stop you from doing that because uh, I got housekeeping notes for our people. Uh, a few notes before we begin. You can ask questions anytime in the chat area. We use the chat. If I find something in questions, I'll, I'll pull it out and, and deliver it. But we, we'd love things to go in the chat so everyone can see them. So always choose panelists and attendees, right? So you want your your comments, your questions, to go to everybody on this webinar because we often get great conversations or people are asking similar questions. Uh, and I will relay these to our fabulous guest hosts uh, as soon as there's an opportunity to do it. Uh, so let's join us for our first activity, which is uh, finding out where you're from, how late you're up, what's going on with you. I'm going to look into chat uh, and see who we've got. And we have uh, Creusa from San Diego. We've got Amy in Vermont, uh, Juanita in, where is Juanita? Uh, Sacramento. Good morning. We've got Tiffany in New York. Hello, Tiffany. I'm so glad you're here. Katie from Central Coast, California. We've got Jennifer in sunny Portland. Fabulous. Fantastic. Okay, we have a beautiful lineup. We've got a great topic. I am excited uh, for all of us to learn more about psychological safety. So let's go over to you, Jessica and Karen. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. It's always so neat to hear where everybody's um, joining us from uh, all over the world, all over the U.S. It's, uh, it's quite a pleasure. So as Elizabeth um, mentioned, my name's Jessica, and I'm actually calling in from Ottawa, Canada. Um, the weather's pretty nice here. It's quite warm, and we are at about 12 o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time. So Karen, where are you calling in from? I'm from just west of Chicago, so... 35 miles or 70 uh, kilometers or so from lovely Naperville, Illinois. And one of the things that I, I really love also is, you know, hearing where everybody is from and really understanding that this topic of five C's and psychological safety is really universal. It doesn't matter whether you're in Canada, whether you're in the United States, whether you're in Europe, China, Australia, anywhere else in the world is really something that's applicable to all of us because wherever we are, we're all human beings. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And all contexts as well. So I mean, the importance of psychological safety, it doesn't discriminate in terms of environments or places in the world. And so we're just so glad that you guys are here um, to learn and to have a conversation about uh, the five C's. So Really, when we think about the importance of psychological safety, I would say now more than ever, this is a really, really important time to think about what psychological safety is and how we can ensure that people are well taken care of and feel safe to be their best selves. Um, right now, such uncertain times, right? We're, we're dealing with all sorts of um, uncertainty and change. And with that comes... Um, it comes a little bit of fear. Um, and so when that happens, the, the skills that we actually need to do really innovative work, complex problem solving, um, we can't necessarily access those skills in the same way when, when we're not feeling safe. And so Karen and I came together to really talk about this. Uh, Karen has a strong background, as you heard, uh, in lean management. She's worked with multiple organizations. Um, and I have a background in a little bit in lean, but mostly in mental health, where we, we started to talk about what gets in the way of people really, you know, sustaining the changes in lean, uh, employees feeling really comfortable raising problems at work, um, asking for help, coming up with really uh, innovative new ways of doing things. And it really boiled down to this concept of psychological safety. And so psychological safety is, uh, if you break it down, it's the belief and feeling that you can bring your true, whole, authentic self to work, and that there'd be no repercussion in terms of doing that. So for instance, feeling like you can raise your hand and identify that there's a problem. Um, being able to feel appreciated and respected and included um, at work. These are all things that would happen when we're feeling psychologically safe. Karen, do you want to add to that? Absolutely. And, you know, in Lean, we, we, we have the five S's, which everybody is familiar with that when we're thinking about how do we create a safe environment for people to work in, uh, everybody knows all about the five S's and that's really is our physical environment, right? And it also, we clean and sort things and make sure everything is in order so we can see a problem. And oftentimes in Lean, we focus on tools and on that physical safety, maybe because, you know, Toyota production system came originally from manufacturing, but the respect for people portion is often less well-defined, right? So we talk about respect for people, we have various different definitions about respect for people, but what is it that are the specific things that we actually do that create that respect for people? And I love working with Jessica and it's been so interesting to look at the lean work really and that respect for people part of it from the mental health and the real, you know, people, how do we make people feel safe? How do we allow people to feel appreciated and respected and bring their authentic self to work? And we really thought, you know, there isn't something in lean that we can use, just like there is five S's for physical safety. And really, if you don't have an underlying sense of psychological safety, you're not going to be able to use those five S's for physical safety. So, of course, Jessica and I, well, when we see a problem, we think somebody somebody should do something about it and that somebody who should do something about it is us. So we created the five C's of psychological safety. And um, our goal is to make them as well known and for you to use them and know them as well as the five S's. Yes. Yeah, no, very well said. And, you know, when we think about innovation and improvement work, it can't really happen without that core foundation of psychological safety. Um, and so we, Karen and I actually oftentimes say that it's the prerequisite, creating the environment where people can bring their true authentic selves to work. That's the prerequisite for all learn, like healthy learning, for growth, for innovation and for improvement. So why don't we just delve right into the five C's, um, starting with the first C, which is clear expectations. 
So clear expectations really are so, so important because what we know is that when we don't know what's expected of us, that can be very um, unsettling. And so a clear expectation starts with leaders. It starts with leaders, um, you know, walking their employees through what's expected of them and not assuming that they understand. So oftentimes, you know, you're in an office with somebody and then you both walk away and you believe that you have the same expectation or understanding of what's needed to be done. But then you only learn when you come back together that you both walked away with a different understanding. And so how can we how can we work to ensure that our expectations are really, really clear so that nobody has to, you know, go back to their desk and, and wonder if what they're doing is actually the value add work. Um, the other part around clear expectations is that sometimes, you know, the words we, we learn in multiple different ways, not just verbally. And so oftentimes when we're setting expectations, we're setting them, you know, verbally with people through our verbal communication skills. But a lot about what we need to do is actually show people what is expected. There's a teaching element. So as a leader, if you're expecting somebody to do something, we might need to, you know, explain it, but then also model it for them, have them practice and us observe and then provide our feedback to make sure that, okay, yes, now we we're both clear on what the expectation is. And a third piece around expectations is that expectations need to be realistic. If we want people to feel safe, they need to have the skills to be able to do the job. If we're setting an expectation that is outside of people's skill set, then this creates a lot of um, uncertainty and feelings of not being safe. And so we have to make sure that the expectation matches the skill set of the person that you're asking to complete the job. Absolutely. And, you know, this is clear expectations are so fundamental and sometimes as leaders we say well of course everybody knows what's expected of them but i'm going to actually challenge you and ask you whether you're a leader or whether you're a person doing the work i'd like you to just take a moment and think to yourself do i know exactly the work i am supposed to be doing today for my customers, for the organization. Like if I sit down right now and I wrote that list down and I brought it to my supervisor or manager or leader and said, hey, this is what I believe I'm supposed to be doing today. Do you think it would be a match or not? And a lot of times when I talk to team members who are working and I say, okay, well, what's the expectation of what work you're going to get done today? And they're like, oh, I'm not sure. I don't know whether I should work on this piece of work first for this customer or this piece of work for this customer. There's so many changing priorities. And especially now in this time when the environment is changing, customer needs are changing. We don't know whether we're gonna work at home, whether we're gonna go back to the office, whether we're gonna work in a hybrid environment. There's so much uncertainty. And as a leader, you need to really make sure that you are, first of all, clear on the expectations yourself, because you may not know this, but actually the word priority is singular. And it didn't become a plural word until like the 1940s. So priority means one. What is <laughs> I know, isn't that shocking? So if you say, well, we have multiple priorities, I can assure you, you don't have clear expectations. So again, how are we making our expectations clear, not just verbally? Do people have a written list of what they need to do by when? Are we clear with people about, oh, if there's something that you don't have that you need either in your own skill set or in the resources to do your work, like a computer program or um, a manual for something that, or that, we expect you to raise your hand and say, hey, I don't have what I need and that's okay. Because unless those expectations are super clear, people aren't going to be able to feel certain. And if they don't feel certain, there's no way for them to feel psychologically safe. Everything rests on this. So 
my challenge for you today. If you think that your expectations are clear, whether you've given them as a leader or you're a team member, please check with the people you're leading or with your leader, because I'm actually not so certain that <laughs> the expectations are as clear as you think they are. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, a good challenge, Karen. All right. So that brings us to C number two. Uh, so this is about connection and how frequently we connect with the people that we work with. So um, connecting regularly really helps to build psychological safety at work. Um, and so when we think about connection, human beings are actually wired for connection. Their brains were built for connection and we learn through connection with others. Um, when we feel safe with the people who are our teachers, um, then we're more apt to, to learn from them. Um, when we don't feel safe, our brain literally shuts down and we go into what we call fight, flight, or freeze mode. And so we're, not, we're no longer accessing skills that are allowing us to actually learn. So when we connect with people regularly, we're actually, what we're doing is we're building a foundation for which we, we have a relationship, we know people, even a little bit about them outside of work, which I know for some leaders, that's a really scary thing. I think sometimes people feel like, oh, my work self, we, we kind of put ourselves into a little box and we can't share information about who we are outside of work. And, you know, we, we don't put pictures of our families up in the office. I mean, this concept of connecting regularly really just kind of dissects all of that. And to create psychological safety, we need to know who people are at their core. Uh, you don't need to know all of the details, but who are they? And to genuinely care about who those people are. The more we connect with people, the easier it's going to be when times get tough to be able to put up your hands and say, I made a mistake and I'm, I'm sorry. Um, it'll be easier for people to be vulnerable when we have frequent connections with people. Um, and so this is something, again, it's we're wired for connection and we need to be doing more of this in order for people to feel safe. So now just like clear expectations, well, what does connect regularly really mean? What's regularly? How often? How much is too little? How <laughs> often is too much? So I was very surprised um, as I worked with organizations uh, during 2020 and for you know part of 2021. And I'd say to team members, well, how often do you see your teammates? How often do you see your leaders? How often do you check in. And sometimes I heard, oh, well, I haven't seen anyone for two weeks. Or I haven't seen anyone for a week. And I thought, wow, just think about it, how difficult that would be, first of all, to understand clear expectations in constantly changing times and times of uncertainty, where we have many competing priorities. <laughs> If you're not hearing from and seeing from your leader, your supervisor, your manager, and your teammates with whom you share work and work together with, how are you going to know clearly what to do? So connect regularly. I would say we need to see our people we work with at least once a day. So oftentimes teams will say to me, but our work isn't the kind of work that's transactional work. We don't actually do something that changes every day. So why do we need to uh, connect every day? Because that connection isn't just about making sure the work is progressing. It's checking in to, making, to make sure that people have what they need and that they feel okay, that something difficult didn't happen in their lives overnight. So I would say the minimum amount of time to check in would be once a day. If you already had a once a day check-in, hmm, why don't you check in a second time at the end of the day, see how people's day went, right? Say thank you to people for doing their work. That checking in creates trust and it allows us to make sure that expectations are clear. But when we have th that trust that we have, really comes from that connection 
that we have regularly. There was a study that uh, for my kind leader book, there's a study that uh, showed, and it was it was taken um, from employees in North America, so United States and Canada, and it found that most people saw or heard from their leader for less than one hour a week, one hour a week or less. So that's 12 minutes a day. And they really felt disconnected and they didn't feel creative and they felt, um, you know, really disengaged. And that the optimum amount of time for them to have that connection was an hour a day. And it doesn't mean that you have to spend an hour a day focused on each person, but think about it. If you spend 15 minutes in huddle at the in the morning, 15 minutes at the end of the day, you have some communication about a project or the work that people are doing. And then there's some email back and forth that led to unbelievably exponential um, improvement in people's trust. It led to improvement in their ability to be innovative, to be engaged people need to be connected. And <laughs> this is so simple. What was the thing that most people really, that was the worst thing about, um, you know, 2020 was being apart from each other. Mm -hmm. So again, if you think your expectations are clear, I'm going to ask you to go back and check for connection. If you think you're connecting regularly enough, <laughs> ask you to really reflect on that and go back and think, how could I connect more regularly and more often? Yeah, it's such a good um, thing for us to think about, especially as we're in this transition phase, going back to maybe a hybrid workforce or some of us are working from home um, permanently. Um, when we were at the office, informal connections happened um, all the time. So you might cross paths in the hallway or at the water cooler. And so you were able to say, oh, hey, Joe, how are the kids? And you'd have these little opportunities to build connection with people. When apart, when working apart, you have to actually build those things in consciously. They don't happen by chance. And so, um, when we think about, and when you think about Karen's challenge, if you are in a situation where you're working from home, or maybe there are some people on your team that are in the office and some people that are home, how can we make sure that everybody is getting that same opportunity to connect with each other? How, how do we build that in to our new reality? Yeah. Jessica, I have a quick question for you before we go on to see number three. Thank you. Know I, I, I had that fabulous opportunity to be Jessica's Jessica's coach for a number of years. How often did we talk to each other in our coaching relationship? Every single day. What did Every you think day. about that in the beginning? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I came from mental health and moved into a lean environment where Karen was my coach. And I remember um, when I accepted the job, they had said, you're going to have this coach, Karen Ross, um, and she's going to meet with you every day for 30 minutes to provide coaching. And at first, my alarm bells went off. I was like, what? Who has time to meet with somebody every day for 30 minutes? It wasn't the environment that I was used to. And so for whatever reason, it seemed very scary for me. But I will tell you. Meeting with Karen for 30 minutes every day was, it was the best part of my day and continues to be my, my favorite time of day. We have such a strong relationship, not only from a uh, work perspective, which we do, but also from a friendship perspective. Um, and so, yeah, every single day, maybe intimidating at first, but I promise you there, there are quite the benefits that come from that. Thank you. Connect regularly. And if you think you are connecting regularly, see how you can connect more regularly. It will build more trust and help people to have clear expectations. Yeah, absolutely. All right, moving on, we are on C3. So to build psychological safety, we need to to be certain that people care for us genuinely, that it's authentic, that it's, they're not just, you know, faking it. Um, and so when we think about like the psychology behind this, we are very, very good at picking up when people are not being genuine. 
um, our spidey senses go, go up and we can tell when somebody's faking it. We really do need to practice caring for people from a genuine place. And this is not always easy for people, but it absolutely, it, there are skills that can be trained. And the skill is empathy. Empathy is the most important skill when it comes to really, truly caring about people. Um, we need to stop and think about the other people's perspective, ask questions to really understand their perspective and, and try to walk in their shoes. Um, and when we do so, we build the environments where people feel like they can have bad days and, and still be okay, or they don't need to know all the answers. They can say, I'm confused and ask for help. If they feel like somebody's not being genuine, it's a much scarier feeling to be able to show any sort of vulnerability. So I always think this is one that's, uh, you know, sometimes people say, well, how do I, how do I really care genuinely, right? And from a lean perspective, I think this is one of those things that really goes with respect for people and our idea of going to see and connecting regularly, right? Is that when we go and see, we're not there just to go and see, okay, did we finish all of this work? We get to, we go and see how is somebody doing? How are they doing the work? And the more often we go and see, the easier it is for us to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes because we're there and we're actually in their shoes and we're creating those connections and building trust and building a relationship. If you actually don't spend time with people, it's very hard to care genuinely about them. And I want you to think about just in your own family, if you're partner or your spouse or your child is unhappy about something and they're crying or upset, in general, we don't just say to them, go away and we don't want to have anything to do with you. We actually spend more time with them. And the more time we spend with them and the more we help them through difficulties and the more we get to know them and the more we can empathize with their situation because we're actually there with them, the more genuinely we can care about them. So the challenge for this one, and I really want you to do this for every interaction that you have with people at work, and of course you could do it at home too, is I want you to really think, am I actually present in the moment and caring about this person? Do I actually genuinely care about their situation, the difficulty they're having, the struggle they may, ha may be having with their work? Oh, maybe they don't have the right tool to do their work. Mm -hmm. Or Am I just actually either not caring or pretending to care? Because we need you to care. We need to care about the people that we're with. And it's okay if you say, actually, I realize I don't really care about the, this person. Perfect. Now you can figure out the ways to genuinely care. Mm -hmm. And it's a fabulous practice. It's really part of that respect for people. And Again, to do it, you need to connect regularly. And the more regular <laughs> you connect, the clearer people's expectations are going to be. So it all ties together. It most certainly does. It all ties together. And just to add one more point around caring genuinely, for me, what this C is all about is it's the alignment between what we say and what we do. So when things are not aligned, when we say something, but then we act differently than the words that we put out into the world, we actually, um, we create fear because now people don't trust. They don't know what to expect. They, we've heard you say something, but you're behaving in a different way. So to care genuinely really means that what you say, you genuinely believe, and then you follow up with action. There's action that support it. And so it's that alignment of your behaviors and your words. Actually, Jessica, just a funny small thing about that, that my husband and I were talking about last night. We were on hold for a long time with a service provider. And mm -hmm. of course, we had that message that said, we're experiencing a larger than normal call volume. Right. You really care about your business. Yes. You know, just hold on the line. Oh, it will be one hour and 30 minutes. <laughs> until 
<laughs> we get to your call. And so the truth is, even in that situation, hmm. again, the words, we care about your business. Well, if you really cared about my business, I wouldn't have to wait an hour and have to have a service provider, right? We are, as people, extremely attuned to yes. that misalignment and that alignment, right? Yes. Yeah, that's a, a really great example. All right. Moving right along to C4. So consistent kindness. Now I always let Karen take the lead on this one because this is her bread and butter. So Karen, do you want to start with this one? Sure, absolutely. And we've been talking about trust versus fear and about words versus actions. And I want you to think back to a time that at work where perhaps you made a mistake and you did something wrong and you brought that to the attention of your leader or maybe it was brought to the attention of uh, your leader and your leader, you're, you were like really worried, oh my goodness, what's gonna happen? Maybe they're gonna yell at me, maybe I'm gonna get fired. And your leader responded to you kindly and said, I understand that you've made this mistake. I worked for a payroll company. When I first started working, I made a huge mistake and I thought I was in the sandbox test environment, learning how to practice to use the payroll system. And I actually paid someone $150,000 in reality by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and you can imagine as a new employee, how I must have felt about that when I realized, actually, of course, I didn't realize that I'd made the mistake, but luckily the system had checks and balances. So they, the system <laughs> realized I made the mistake. My leader responded to me extremely kindly. And because they responded to me kindly, that created trust. And that kind response was consistent, right? Because when leaders respond to us kindly, consistently, that is what creates trust. We know we can be our authentic self. Mm -hmm. We know it's okay to make a mistake. We can bring up an idea. We don't have to worry that, oh, someone's going to roll their eyes and say, okay. And then even if they don't say it, you know, they're thinking, oh, that's a dumb idea, right? That's the craziest thing we ever heard. Mm -hmm. So it's extremely important if you're a leader to think, am I acting kindly? Am I speaking kindly? Is my body language kind? <laughs> Is my tone of voice kind? Everybody makes mistakes. When we act unkindly, it creates fear. When we act inconsistently as leaders, sometimes kind and sometimes unkind, people don't know what to expect. Again, back to clear expectations. If you don't have those clear expectations and consistency, in kindness, people will become fearful. They mm -hmm. won't feel psychologically safe. They won't actually bring up problems because they won't know, oh, am I going to get kind leader Karen or I'm going to get unkind leader <laughs> Karen? I don't wanna take the chance that I might get the unkind one, right? So that consistency is super important and nobody is perfect, no one. Not the people who do the work and not us as leaders. So. We are not going to be 100% kind as leaders because we are all human beings. So knowing that, monitor yourself carefully. And when you're not kind, you know, go and apologize to the person and say, hey, I was at the end of my rope today. I didn't actually respond to you in the correct way. I'm sorry. Let's sit down and talk about this again. Or if you feel you're not going to respond kindly, take a deep breath, say, okay, I'm at the end of my rope. <laughs> hey, let me just think about this. And we'll talk about this tomorrow. It's okay, don't worry, you're not in trouble. Everything is going to be okay. And then remember to be kind to yourself too. The good thing about practicing consistent kindness is that the next opportunity to practice being kind is gonna arrive in two minutes. <laughs> I can personally guarantee it, right? Yeah, no, no shortage of opportunity for sure. Um, and so I just want to really kind of uh, talk a little bit more about this consistency piece. And Karen, you did such a good job of describing it. When I think about from a mental health perspective, um, we're born into this world at, 
infants and we look to our caregivers to be able to determine if we're safe. So we rely on them heavily to meet our basic needs like food and shelter and uh, comfort through touch. Um, And so the response that we get from caregivers, or if you apply this to a leadership context from our leaders, um, especially during times of stress, the baby looks to the caregiver to see, am I safe? Am I getting my needs met? When their needs aren't met, it can create some difficulty in their relationship because there's now fear that's that's developed. And so it actually hinders their learning. If you apply this to a work context, it's the exact same. So the consistency is even during times when things aren't going well, are we getting a kind response? Um, yes, when things are going good, you might, you know, it's, it's easy to be kind when things are going well. But what happens when, when we're stressed? What happens when things aren't going so well at work, when our targets aren't being met? Are we still met with consistent kindness? This is what's going to create psychological safety for our people is that if they are met with kindness and Karen, your point around, we're all human. We all have bad days. 100% agreed. These opportunities where maybe we've had a bad moment and we go back, like you had suggested, we circle back and we apologize actually are going to do such great, great things for your relationship, because now there's vulnerability. We can see that the leaders too are human and that, you know, they have good and bad days and that they have responded. They've thought about and come back and apologized. So yeah, consistency is so important here. Okay. Are we ready for the last C? We're ready. We're ready. Okay. So this is the concept of co-regulation. So to co-regulate emotion, this concept comes from mental health, but it applies to all contexts. And so what is co-regulation? This is really like a feedback loop where Uh, Based on what I observe and experience in my environment, my emotions can change based on your emotion. So as a baby, if I'm really stressed and I look to my caregiver who's very calm and stays calm during my distress, we start to kind of meet each other. If I'm dysregulated, I'm down here and um, caregiver is very Let's do that opposite. If I'm really dysregulated, I'm up here and caregiver is calm and down here. What ends up happening is the baby's internal states work to match the, the caregiver. This also happens, though, if the caregiver is stressed and the baby is, is not in a stress state, but then sees that caregiver is stressed, the baby ends up coming up and matching the level of stress and feels the stress uh, that the caregiver has. And so let's apply this to the work context because it's the exact same. Any relationship that you have, it applies. If I'm a leader of an organization and things are not going well, and I stand up in front of my people and I am calm and encouraging and um, honest, um, but I maintain my calm state, people are going to look to me and their emotion is going to, rather than you going up and being, you know, really, really anxious about the state of affairs, uh, which would kind of have them meet that anxiety state, you're actually going to help them feel calm. And so one example that I use, because I've had this personal experience myself, and I just think it's a good way of highlighting this concept of co-regulation is traveling on an airplane, which maybe many of us haven't done in some time, maybe some of you have, but when traveling on an airplane, you're, you're, let's say you're going through some turbulence. For me, that is a scary experience. And so the first thing I do as I feel my anxiety go up is I look to the flight attendant and I'm looking for their facial um, cues. I'm looking for a smile on their face. If they look at all distressed, I am going to be panicking. But if that flight attendant is looking calm, is smiling, is, you know, not really batting an eye to the turbulence that are happening, I instantly feel calm. So that's one, you know, example to highlight how co-regulation works. Karen, do you want to add anything? Yes, absolutely. And this is so important for the kindness aspect and also for our, um, you know, uh, connect regularly aspect is that oftentimes our emotional state 
are is what what has us act unkindly, right? Something happens and we're in that emotional state and we're angry and we're riled up and we realize don't realize that okay, now my body language is tense and my uh, voice is raised. And then we go and we talk to someone and they're gonna respond in exactly that same way, right? If I come with my hackles up, I'm walking my dog down the street and see another dog with their hackles up and barking, my dog's gonna put his hackles up and bark at the other dog, right? So as a leader, if I go and I'm just all uh, raised like that, that's what I'm gonna get back from team members. So we need to actually say, okay, knowing that other people are going to co-regulate to us, how do I take a moment, calm myself down, even if it's difficult news, even if it's unpleasant news, how do I remain calm? How do I, because then, as I always say, if the top is calm, the bottom is <laughs> to be calm, right? And that's going to create a much less uncertain environment. It's going to help people. And it doesn't mean that you don't tell the truth, right? You can be genuine, but mm -hmm. do, it a, do it in a calm way. Mm -hmm. And others will remain calm. And when we remain calm, we have access to our problem solving abilities, to our creative abilities, to our innovative abilities. So we can figure out what to do in any situation. So co-regulate is so important. And so the challenge for this one, because oftentimes we're not even conscious about why we feel a certain way. When you feel yourself getting emotional, when you, if you're in, you know, with somebody else, start to think about what are their cues, right? Am I feeling like this because they're feeling like this? And then pay attention to your own feelings and your own body language and the tone of your voice. And then watch what's happening with someone else. How am I affecting them, right? So oftentimes, I don't think, Jessica, we're very conscious about this co-regulation. It's kind of going on in the background, but it would be great if everybody became much more conscious about it. Yes, no, absolutely. Sorry, I've got my family at home and I just had to mute there for a second. <laughs> Probably best that you didn't hear the big crash in the background. Um, <laughs> Um, no, absolutely. Oftentimes it's something we don't even realize is happening. It just happens so um, behind the scenes. But to bring that level of awareness to your leadership, to, you know, as an employee, as a, a friend, you know, in all of your relationships, this is really going to take you to that next level where not only are you helping others feel safe, but you're also helping yourself feel safe so that you, you can all be your best selves. So yeah, absolutely. All right. So I can't even believe that we've just uh, wrapped it up. So those are the five C's. And, you know, we've really just scratched the surface, Karen and I. Um, hopefully you, you are able to kind of walk away with enough, but we'll, we'll devote some time to some questions. But Elizabeth, I think we're going to, before going to questions, turn it over to you. Karen, is there anything else that you wanted to say? I just wanted to say that, you know, this work has been unbelievably meaningful to Jessica and I. And I think, again, oftentimes we pay so much time to the continuous improvement pillar of Lean and all of the different tools and how we can improve. And we actually, we just don't have those specific ways to pay attention to the respect for people part. So Jessica and I uh, really are working on this and want people to have those tools. So we have workshops and we work with organizations to um, help you to be able to assess where you are now, where you want to be, and then put those strategies in place based on the five C's so you can improve the psychological safety. So um, we'll be sending out this uh, information afterwards and you'll see how to contact uh, Jessica and I. And if you have any questions that we don't answer or need any help, we want you to be psychologically safe in your organization. <laughs> to be psychologically safe so reach out to us yeah absolutely um thank you gals and so what i want to say is for anyone who has questions 
for Jessica and Karen. Um, uh, I'm going to give you what's coming up at the cafe, um, but we'll circle back and uh, open the floor. I see one question. Um, Melody, we will post the video of this webinar, usually the Monday after the session is when it gets posted. Also, anyone who registered for this, we send an email to you let, to let you know when it's posted and you can view it on the Just In Time Cafe website. So think about questions you might have for these two uh, amazing gals. I am so thrilled that they created this. It just feels like there's there was just a, a gap in, as Karen says, paying attention to that respect for people side of the house as opposed to the fix it side, because uh, you need that to be able to fix it. So think about questions and I will tell you what's coming up. Uh, this webinar is with Sammy Obara, another lovely human being. Uh, it's called the Five Habits of Highly Effective Lean Leaders, August 5th, 11 uh, a.m. Pacific. And this premise is, you know, why do some lean in, uh, implementations fail? Uh, lots of reasons, but there's one aspect he likes to fo focus on because it's, it's avoidable, which is the habits of leaders. Lean implementation works well when the leaders focus their efforts. Uh, and if you want to be better at evaluating your own effectiveness, uh, if you want to understand how to overcome those challenges to building better habits, then come join this session in a couple of weeks. Sammy is a expert on the Toyota production system, worked at Toyota. Uh, he's a Toyota veteran and he's got great insights and guidance on how to do this. So join us for that. And the next is the latest episode of our podcast is still out. That's featuring Katie Anderson celebrating a year since she got her uh, award-winning book out, le le Learning to Lead, Leaning to Learn, and me learning to say the title. Uh, this is a great episode. It's got, uh, we always review, it's a great a conversation with Katie. We talk about our experiences in Japan with her. She's going to start Japan trips again. That's a big, uh, very revealing. And also we review apps every time. And we also answer a question from our listeners. So the, the app is Jackbox, which is fascinating. It's a, a way to be it, engaging remotely with teams, probably helps with psychological safety, playing games with each other, having fun. Uh, and uh, there's a question about how we remember uh, what we learned, which is uh, a great conversation. So let's come back. You can go to the last slide and just let's sit there. Uh, we've got questions for you too. And if you don't mind, my lovely host have asked if we can uh, put you guys on video. So I'm gonna experiment with doing that. But first I'm gonna ask the question. I've got two lined up for you. Um, one is from Amy. What would you recommend in an organization where the five C's are not happening consistently now, uh, where to start, how to start? Now I'm gonna go uh, put you guys on video of your game. Here we go, let's go to the participants. And Elizabeth, should I stop sharing the screen here or do I? You stay right where you are. It's good. They'll okay. just right. show up. Um, let's see, Amy and more. Now, I, I think I'm not allowed to put them on video. If you want to put yourself on video, I don't know if you have the ability. This is an experiment. <laughs> <laughs> we love that. And it's in a psychologically safe atmosphere, so we can do it. It is. Yeah, so I, I find myself unable to bring my the lovely participants to light. So would you like to field that that question in the meantime? Sure. Sorry, what was the name of the person that submitted the question? Um, let's see, that was Amy. Amy. And, yeah. Well, thank you so much for your um, for your question, Amy. It is a good one. And people often do ask it in terms of where do we start? A lot of organizations are not implementing five C's at this time. And so Karen and I always suggest, you know what, you start somewhere. It doesn't really matter where, just start. And so there are five C's, perhaps there's one C that you're feeling like, you know what, there is a tangible 
thing that I could do. I feel like I could, maybe it relates to some of the challenges that Karen put out there today, but there is something that I can do to try and create psychological safety, not only for um, myself in terms of how I feel, but also to create that environment at work where people feel psychologically safe. So if there is a particular place where you're feeling like you could start to uh, pave that path, I would suggest you, you just start. Karen and I, um, with some of the workshops that we offer um, and the deeper dive sessions that we offer, uh, you actually have a workbook where there are tangible next steps, like based on where your organization is performing, what do you do next? And so that might be an option for you. Um, But I would say you start anywhere. What do you think, Karen? Yes, absolutely. Because the important thing is to start. The thing I would suggest is that if you know a leader who would be more open to hearing this discussion, I'd bring up the topic with them. I'd sit down with them and say, hey, I just went to this webinar on the five C's of psychological safety, and I'd love to share it with you. I'd love to share it with the team. Can we, you know, let's just talk about it because in the same way, organizations and leaders don't think they're unkind and they don't think that they're creating unpsychologically safe conditions, right? People in general think, oh, the way I'm acting is kind. We have psychological safety here, or it's just not a topic that's thought of at all. So opening up that dialogue is a great first place to start. And then giving that person you're talking with a little bit of time to digest it and think about it. So, and then go back in a couple of weeks and ask kindly, what did you think? Have you had some time to think about what is, what's happening in our organization? And then as always in Lean, we PDCA our way from there. Great, thank you both. Uh, One other question here from Robinson. And he is asking, what would you recommend in terms of the best way to share these learnings with your superiors in a sensible way? Well, you know, here's the thing. First of all, uh, Jessica and I have a one pager about the five C's and Elizabeth, we'd be happy to pass it on to you and you can send it out to everybody. And it's really like literally on one page and it's perfect for pinning up and sticking somewhere. And it's, um, you know, super easy to share as a PDF. Again, you know, people tend to be doing the best that they can and they tend to do what they know. And we have to think from positive intention, even if we disagree. So I wouldn't go in and say, hey, I don't think we have a psychologically safe environment and you as the leader are doing a terrible job because then in general, people aren't going to listen. I again might just kindly approach the person, pass them on say, hey, I went to this webinar, thought you might be interested in this. Can we sit down and have a discussion? I'd love to hear more about your thoughts. And often then we find that people, again, connect regularly, go back, (laughs) go back to uh, go go back and say, let's talk about this. Let's open up a dialogue. The more you connect, the more you create trust, the more you say my expectation, I want to bring this to your attention because I want to have the best workplace Mm -hmm. and we can all be the best that we can be. I think Mm -hmm. that's really going to help. Yeah, just to add. So thank you, Robinson, for that question. Um, Psychological safety is a it's a difficult one for some people because it's not something that we see necessarily. It's not like tangible. It's a feeling. It's a belief. um, And it's an internal process. Right. It's it's how we're made to feel. So it's emotional. Um, And so Sometimes what can be helpful, what is kind of observable and that most organizations have some sort of data on is engagement scores or um, perhaps retention or uh, leadership behaviors. So you might have theism, right? 
absenteeism. Absolutely. These are some uh, data points that might actually, you might already have at your discretion that you can use when entering a conversation about psychological safety. So it might just be the starting point in terms of your conversation. That's nice. Um, well, you've got some people excited to start. Uh, Helen said, thank you, every, everyone. This was wonderful. And I can't wait to start practicing. Um, oh. And uh, let's see, you've got Jennifer saying, loved hearing about the five C's and how they overlap and support each C. That's true, actually. The overlapping is really nice the way they work. Thanks, Karen and Jessica. And then uh, Tiffany says, it's so valuable to have actionable ways to create this environment. It's one thing to feel you have it or don't, but understand the elements that create and support it is the key. Love this list. Thank you. Thank and you. Robinson says, thank you for your answers again. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for being here. Honestly, it shows me that you're interested in making the world a better place, making our workplaces a better place, um, which, as Karen mentioned earlier, there is this, this effect that if we create kind workplaces, guess what, then our homes are kinder and our neighborhoods are kinder and our communities are kinder. So thank you to all of you for being here and uh, wanting to join us on this journey to making the world a better place. Thank you both for bringing this to the cafe. And I look forward to you visiting again. We can't wait and thank you for bringing so many kind and helpful topics to create a better, kinder world, Elizabeth and Tracy. That's why we love the Just In Time Cafe. <laughs> More to come. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. -bye. Bye. Bye.